Okay, I'm uh, calling the Finance Committee meeting to order on December 17, 2019 at 2.40 p.m. on the snowy day. And I want to thank um, the members of the committee. We have um, four council members, which constitutes a quorum, and two of the three uh, resident members, and I appreciate everybody being here under the uh, weather conditions we have, but I'm also pleased that we don't have to schedule another meeting until next year and that we can now go and enjoy the holidays. Also, as I had uh, informed everybody on the committee by email, I'm pleased that the council acted favorably on a number of uh, Issues I challenge is now we have five, uh, mem all five members from the council present. So, um, again, thank you all for being here. Uh, we don't have to deal with the guidelines because the guidelines were approved without uh, any changes, and um, our uh, president will be sending them to the uh, recipients, including the people who are to get copies, so that's all done. And uh, Kendrick Park um, CPA proposal order was um, approved, and the uh, Hickory Ridge proposal was also approved. So we have several things that are out of the way. There are three things that I want to um, concentrate on. Um, and the, they're going to take, I think, the most significant piece of time. And I want to try and do this um, by f 4 o'clock so that we can um, all get out of here and uh, have plenty of daylight to get where we need to go. But um, a process f uh, to complete our work on assessing the affordable housing priorities policy, uh, the percent for art bylaw, and the committee charge, which we have a responsibility or request from um, the uh, GOL committee to get back to them with our comments about the committee charge. So those are the three major items. Uh, Kathy worked on a, um, jumping down for a second, meeting schedule for 2020. Uh, Kathy has a proposed um, schedule that she was going to send to all members of the committee that takes us um, through what period? It takes us up to June, um, and everyone should have it. I forwarded it by email. What I did is went through council meetings, the Monday meetings, and picked the Tuesday after each of those meetings. And then, as people had been alerted earlier by Andy, when we get to May, we are at least anticipating we would be meeting weekly as often as twice a week. So I didn't give specific uh, May dates, Andy, other than to put May in as two. And last year, my memory is we met on Tuesday and Thursday. But I think we were also flexible depending on, because departments were coming in. So sometimes we didn't always do it in 2.30 in the afternoon. Sometimes we did it another time slot. So May is uh, not pegged specifically to council meetings. But everyone, did everyone receive it? It, it was just sent literally as we were sitting here. So um, let me just say a couple things on it. Um, one of the most important thing is to get the first three or four meetings um, in everybody's calendar and make sure that they're okay. And we can always come back and talk about the remainder of the dates. Um, at a later date. So let me just tell you that they're January 7 and 28, February 11 and 25th. And uh, so um, I guess the uh, most immediate question is whether those four dates are problems uh, for anyone. And yes? I'm going to be in China on Jan 7th. On which date? Jan 7th. I'll be back on the 14th. You do a lot of good traveling. Racking up those miles, I guess. 
Uh, Taking care of her family. That too. Uh, okay. So, um, yeah, the, there's one of the April dates that's listed. I will not be in town, but uh, we don't even know who's going to be chair of the committee at that point. And uh, I don't think it's, I think we can postpone discussion of that. So let's go on to the things that are most um, vital to talk about today. Um, I do want to make sure that within the next 30 minutes that we get back to um, the uh, committee charge because I want to make sure that Sonia is here for the discussion of the committee charge. Um, since uh, we have uh, the chair of the um, Parts Commission here, um, why don't I, uh, is it okay if we uh, talk about percent for art for a few minutes? And uh, I also want Sonia to be here for that discussion. So those are the, those are the ones we need her most for, I think. Uh, so uh, Kathy, or can you sure. give us the introduction to launch us? And then we'll talk about the question of what are the financial implications and how to measure what information we need in order to provide a report. Thanks, Andy. Um, I was chair of the ad hoc committee um, that was asked to take a look at the original draft bylaw that town meeting had endorsed and uh, revise it pending discussions, both uh, some issues that it had run into in the Massachusetts legislature of carryover funds, that there wasn't a clear way to do that. And we were a committee of five people, three from the council and two from the arts uh, commission. And Bill worked closely with me and actually he uh, did all the scribing as we went through and agreed on changes and were reformatting. And so what, what I think, you've got copies of the original bylaw as it was written, and then the revision um, and a report from our committee that describes the major changes that we made um, that weren't just editing or uh, streamlining wording. So I think I'll just highlight a few of those um, and then open it for questions or comments. And Bill should feel free to add something I miss. Um, we, we actually had the benefit of our bylaws committee that's been looking at all the town bylaws, has been, have been going through our bylaws and kind of formatting them to look a particular way. So we tried to get as close as we could to how those were formatted and set up. So, um, so I'm just going to go through the major changes in each of the key sections. Um, the purpose has remained the same as it was written, but we added economic as well as cultural vitality to its purpose on why we're, would, we think it makes sense to present, be investing in art. And we have a lot of studies that have shown that that is a key issue of bringing people into town, of building a sense of community so it's not just that it's beautiful, but it also enhances the li livelihood of the town. So we basically just added the words economic vitality to it. The key significant substantive change is we changed the threshold to a million dollars. And what so before a project would be considered as eligible for the percent for art being added to it, it has to be at least a million dollars of new construction. And this means the significant thing about that is that these would generally be financed with debt, so it would go out over time, and the project would be integrated with the construction project itself. So it would be part of its design, either attached to it or in it. And so we would pay, be paying off the 0.5% over time rather than in one chunk. And this avoids needing to accumulate funds. You know, if we had smaller pieces that each one was not enough to do anything significant with art, and then we'd pool them, and it can, at and it can attach the money um, directly to the project. In definitions, we mainly were cleaning up definitions, but we tried to make clear and we just have to double check 
with Sonia and then with Paul that we did this, that when we're talking about what the percent gets applied to in terms of money, it's our general fund money. So if a project was half funded by grants, it would just be the general fund share, or if it was in one of our special funds, it wouldn't apply. So it is just the general fund part that the town would be um, doing it. Um, we made it clear, th um, the charter makes the town manager the appointing authority for any multi-bodied body. This, the art jury was originally listed as being appointed by the art commission. So we changed the appointing authority to the town manager. And we actually thought that was a really good idea because it, uh, we want this to be endorsed by the town and be part of the larger town. So on funding, as I mentioned at the start, by raising the threshold to a million dollars, uh, the funding would mainly, um, would only actually be coming out of bonds. And we eliminated the wording that said we're going to earmark some of this money for maintenance because that would have had to be part of an ongoing operating budget. So we're assuming to the extent the project itself is maintained, this would be maintained. And the commission would be paying attention to not trying to commission art that was going to fall apart right away or you know, would pay attention to likely maintenance costs. We also have um, all for better uh, ways of summarizing it, an escape clause, that if for some reason we're in a crisis, we're in a, a major uh, crunch, we allow for the town council to either eliminate it on a project by project basis or lower the threshold from the 0.5%. And um, there's no more references to special funds because we don't have to accumulate them. We also make it clear in responsibilities under the ARC Commission section that the ARC Commission will be working closely both with the overall town, there's a plan for the whole town on art, it's not just one off each time and it would be involving public discussions, but then when the construction project is underway, before it's underway, working closely to avoid any delay related to the art projects, that if it can't get funded up in time, we can't pick it, um, it could just be canceled because we wouldn't want the project to delay the larger construction project. And this was raised by a couple of the reviewers of the original, um, so we want the timing to work. And it clarifies that throughout, the intention would be that the art commission would be working closely with the town manager. So I, th I think those are the summary of the key changes we made. Almost everything was trying to rearrange words. If a paragraph was six sentences long and we found some redundant wording, we just trimmed it down, unless it was substantive. So um, I'm going to stop there. Bill, is there anything else you think we should? I missed? No, that's my list too. Thank you. And this was unanimous um, in terms of both the specific changes and the final draft. And I, I want to note that the former chair of the Public Art Commission, who was the author of the original bylaw, sat with us throughout as a member of the public, but we paid attention to any concerns he might have had, and he was pleased with this as an outcome. You know, so he didn't come away with feeling like his, um, you know, I think I've been an author of some things you kind of watch someone tear your, your work apart and then you don't like the result. But I think he, he was pleased with the result and it was a very uh, productive. And Sonia sat with us throughout and uh, was extremely helpful on saying, you just can't do that. Or if you want to do it this way, it can only be done in a certain way. So we, we did want to make sure we addressed the funding side, since that was the thing that stalled it last time, that we couldn't really set up funds in the way we were envisioning it wouldn't work. Um, so I am, that is the summary of what you have before you. So questions and then, go ahead. Thank you for that work. I think, I think you summed up your changes really well um, and very easy to understand. Um, my two questions are one, maintenance. I think it's a big assumption to include the maintenance of the art in the building building maintenance. I'm just throwing that out there. And then two, um, I think the um, funding is a huge portion of this. And I'm just curious, um, if we're not in an economic crunch right now with three major building projects, what would constitute an economic crunch such that 
um, it might be proposed to town council to lower the percentage for art. Um, I, I just do a response on the second, and I think you know it may be a, a, a next meeting date. Sonia could show us, but if you if you assume a twenty year or a thirty year debt, and you're putting 05 percent on ten million or on thirty million, and then spreading it across households, it it amounts to a a very in dollars rather than multiple dollars per year. So that's the issue we were looking at is trying because the 0.5 is so low and spreading it out and the interest rates are low right now. So I, I think the the notion with these, this investment, you would want to choose wisely, but it's not adding very much to it. And it could potentially be done even within the overall construction project if the design said one of the things we want to have is this apps with a fountain in it or a seating area or, or, or a statue as you're coming in. But, but yes, it, it clearly is money. Um, but on $30 million, it would not be adding that much on an annual basis in terms of taking tax dollars away from other projects. So, so that, I think, will always be an issue. I mean, it, it, isn't, it isn't a net zero. <laughs> I guess my, I, I understand what you're saying. I guess my point is um, if we're asking people at some point to do an um, override um, and people are already feeling an economic crunch personally, um, that's, that's an issue. Um, and I understand that it's a small amount. It's over a long period of time. I'm just, I'm just wondering, like, is it interest rates that, like, if this was, um, if, it was if we were approaching a higher interest rate or direct, I mean, I just, would like to know, and I think people would be interested in that. Um, I do know from the experience that the state went through, because they had a similar bylaw. Um, when they hit bad economy and had to go into rainy day funds is when they got rid of it. Um, the issue that I think you're raising um, about you know, hitting people with four new capital investments, whether they be construction, renovation, or major, major repairs. Uh, the reality is this is only on the construction. Um, it, it, the way it's written, it does leave it quite vague and leaves it to the town council to decide um, that is good and bad. You know, it's like I can drive a truck through this. Um, at the same time, um, you know, I don't think that any of us want to adopt a bylaw that basically we don't intend to follow. Uh, I think that it's uh, the idea is to adopt a bylaw we think is responsible and to follow. So let me just preface any for the, and say I think the I think the committee did a terrific job um, being very familiar with the earlier um, bylaw which had one major piece that was totally unworkable um, from a financial standpoint um, this is basically brought it into a place where it's workable we can understand this bylaw and it also gives us an opportunity if we feel we are not in sound financial times for us to say, yes, we're going to go ahead and build Building X, but Building X, which, by the way, is not particularly itself a very artful-looking building because those kinds of buildings aren't very artful. Um, to save money, we're not going to do art there, okay? We're, it's off in a field, it's behind trees, it's not a place that many people are going to go to, um, and, you know, it's a way to, to cut down on this, and if we cut down on this, we might be able to do something else in that building that would benefit more people, like having a community room. So I, I'm feeling like this bylaw, the way it is presently pre presented to us, gives us those points of flexibility. Now, am I wrong? Actually, there's one piece that I wanted to add to, to respond to that as a member of the ad hoc committee. Um, 
We put in a provision that's uh, in the definitions that um, it only applies to publicly accessible buildings. Mm -hmm. And that was sort of, if you're building a building that nobody from the public is going to be visiting and it's in the middle of uh, a um, isolated place that nobody is going to see, that, that that's not publicly accessible. Okay. That if the exterior of a building is, um, people are going to drive by frequently, um, that's publicly accessible. If it's a building that people are going to go to and attend, that's publicly accessible. But if we had built the DPW building in the location that was talked about in the middle of a field uh, that was far from any street, uh, that may not have fit that definition. So we did add that piece in there. Uh, the reason that I was in, um, pleased with the idea of having a provision in there um, for the council to be able to make an exception is just to create that possibility um, if it was necessary, but I don't and didn't anticipate that it ever would be necessary. But what I did not want to see happen is to put the council in the position of having to decide we can't afford to do it, so we have to repeal the bylaw. So that by creating a process that is less than repeal, um, we preserve the bylaw if we ever get into the financial bind. Um, not that I think, given the amounts, that it's likely to happen. Um, the one thing that I did want to touch base on getting back to Sonia's uh, point Sonia had raised is that um, it's my understanding that in order to be able to do this as a bond, uh, as a part of the overall project for which you're submitting funding, as she explained it, and I'm, not, I'm looking at you so that you, I don't put words in your mouth that you don't want to own, uh, uh, is that uh, it has to be done as an overall part of the construction project, and if it's not done as an overall part of the construction project, but as, for example, something that's going to be done separately and later, that um, that may not be permissible. That's correct. And uh, so I just wanted to make sure that that understanding was just out there so that we'd, we'd get there. I, I know that the prior finance committee had talked about the prior bylaw in, uh, because um, Mary Lou uh, had explained that at a prior, one of our previous meetings. And what she said was is that the position of the previous finance committee was that it should not be done from debt, that um, it should just be built in as part of the um, ongoing capital budgets. Um, and that obviously is always an alternative. I think that the reason that we didn't put in it is say ad hoc committee, and I'll turn this back to Kathy if I don't, she, um, to, to supplement, is that um, when you get to the costing out, it's going to be, uh, let, that that's, could be a, a significant expenditure in a single year from the capital fund, and it was contrary to the idea of trying to spread out the cost so that um, it would not have a significant effect on any single year. Yeah, Shalini. I really, really liked the way you all changed it, so thank you very much. And um, I think adding to what I'm hearing there, I, w I was wondering if there's a way to capture the indirect, indirect benefits that we um, get from, the, from this kind of art, maybe more people visiting or tourism or, um, because I was reading this and I just wanted to read this line because I thought it was so impactful. Maybe I'm speaking, I am sort of speaking to the choir here, but preaching to the choir, whatever. Anyways, so I just wanted to read this statement which says it's by Americans for the Arts Public Art Network and they say public art stimulates learning and thought about art in society, about our interconnected lives and about the social sphere as a whole. 
And I think we can really bring a sense of community, who we are, values, when we don't just build art that's beautiful, but we do it in a meaningful way that reflects and is, is a way of us coming together. In fact, uh, there's something called um, open, what is it? Open living rooms that you can have events around these pieces of art where people can sort of connect and come together. And um, you know, so it, it's really about revitalizing our uh, community and creating that shared sense of who we are. So I think it's a very powerful thing, and given that it's that we all made it, it's spread over 30 years. Uh, it comes to five thousand dollars per year. I think unless we're in, you know, it, of course we can assess project to project, but I think it's a really valuable addition to our town. And if the commission could create a database of the art that's been created then once we have enough, we can maybe create brochures and put them up on our website for even tourism and so for like people to come in and make it a central part of our town. Okay, yeah, Dorothy. Um, well, we, we do have a lovely art pamphlet right now, which is on the website. I think it's outdoor art. And um, I spoke to somebody who'd been on that committee and she told me that the DPW had, in fact, done maintenance of it and enjoyed doing the maintenance and, in fact, had um, helped position rocks and boulders so that that's some of the maintenance that could happen. Um, I just want to say that I was very, very happy when I read through the report, I guess it was yesterday, and I wanted to say that I deliberately did not want to be on the commission because I am so positively in favor of more public art that I thought if people who are more skeptical financially were on it, that their report would be believed and, and have, have a lot more weight. Um, there are a couple of questions I did have, which is um, at one point I sent, sent, had a little uh, paper that I brought to a meeting on this, which said that I hoped that there would be emphasis on local artists and that the people in the buildings should have some I wouldn't say okay, but buy-in in in it, because uh, part of this is the public art is an expression of values of the community, and um, I just don't want us to to get so far ahead of a lot of people in the community with something which is like totally cutting edge that they would love someplace else, but the people who live in the town or work in that building are are unhappy with. So um, just keeping it very much, related to the people in the town and expressing the values and the history and the culture of the town. Um, I'll just do a quick response, but Bill might like to, too. I think our sense as we talked, and you don't want to write it in too much of a straight hold in a bylaw, is what the Public Art Commission will be doing is trying to do a vision of what art we want, where it could be, and so when the opportunities come up, but then get that kind of buy-in. Um, you know, what, what I've seen in examples of other cities is exactly like that. Sometimes the artwork is uh, celebrating the type of work that's being done by the people who inhabit the building, or it's bringing people to the outside, so that was the notion. Um, I think if we wanted, uh, you know, how a, uh, I'll let Bill respond more on the local artist point, but I think the idea definitely was that the town would have an opportunity to understand what might be possible and do some feedback on it. And then certainly the, the people who are surrounding it, it, you wouldn't do necessarily the same thing at a school that you would do near a fire station, but they could be sure. So, Bill, maybe you want to say something about local or you know how you envision because the Public Art Commission actually would be in charge of making this happen. Yes, thank you, um, William Kays in 32 Goldenrod Circle, Chair of the Public Art Commission. Thank you for having me. Thank you for all the work of the ad hoc committee for Sonia. Um, so. Certainly, stakeholder buy-in is, is a, it's a huge part of our process. When we did Electrify Amherst, we you know, reached out to business owners, got the DPW on board, and I will say thanks to the DPW, who's always been a big supporter of the arts in town and, and helped out whenever they could. 
Local artists is a little bit of a trickier issue in as much as we want the best project we can get on these sites. So we certainly will reach out to, as we always do, and draw from the pool of amazing talent here. But I would love to see a national call, even an international call. I mean, we want our local artists to be in that mix and we will really push to have them included and have their projects considered. But I think in the end, it's, it's about having the strongest possible project that's gonna inspire you know, the students in the school, the visitors to town, um, the DPW workers, uh, you know, the, the entire region and show them that Amherst can be a center for the arts. So what I'm thinking is this, I appreciate the conversation and getting back to Sharon's point for a few minutes ago, I think it would be important, is important, that when we put together our final report back to the uh, council about the proposed bylaw that we have the numbers that you were talking about and of how much it's gonna cost to per, per, per year to pay back, either if it's done um, on funds that are gonna be repaid from the general fund um, on an annual basis coming out of the, the capital portion of the, of the fund um, because it's, that would affect um, other things that could be done or need to be done within the capital fund. I think that the, the answer is gonna be that it's fairly small, but we need to quantify that and present it so that um, both we're comfortable with it and that we can give those numbers to show that we've done due diligence in our work to the community. And the same thing is true for the debt exclusion. Um, I actually did, because we have the ability to do it with uh, Sean Vengano's worksheet, because you can click on and off the um, percent for art, and then you can figure it out for each amount for buildings of various um, costs. So that's actually pretty much available to us with a little bit of uh, playing around with uh, his uh, spreadsheet program. Uh, the, uh, um, but I think we, can, we need to provide that information and we need to provide it for several levels of building and several levels of um, uh, property value on which tax is being paid. To, to demonstrate, I think, that, we, we, that it is a small amount, but um, that's a judgment call we have to be comfortable with after having the numbers right in front of us. So my suggestion would be that uh, we uh, try and get that in for our next meeting, that information, and uh, that we uh, then try and see if we can get a report outlined and together uh, and uh, be able to just move forward with it. Sharon? I think that's a really good um, point. And I think, I think once you have those figures, then, then when you talk about the um, economic vitality that it can bring to a region, you have, you have real numbers, like for this amount, this is, this is the kind of, you know, especially when you're talking about getting international, like opening up to international artists. Um, I think that's a, that's a really strong statement um, and argument for this that you can make to people. And thank you again, both of us. I'm, I'm, I'm certainly for this personally, so. Okay. And as far as Shalini, I think I appreciate your point and I don't know uh, quite frankly, how to do the quantification of it. Certainly the principle can be stated, um, but unless we can find information from somebody who's done a study, I don't know how to do it ourselves just to say, how many people would it, would it bring to town because we have the, the additional pieces of public art since we already have some significant public art. Sharon? I, I think you just answered your question, sort of. Um, I think the more um, 
the more you draw people to town, this just becomes another layer of public art. I know that um, the bid is working on trying to like bring aspects of the Eric Carl into town and the Hitchcock Center into town. And just the more layers of um, art that you can bring into town to you know, have people start thinking about this area in a different way or an enhanced way, um, I, think, I think that's possible. So, uh, Certainly, we'll include it. But yes, Go ahead. small way we that would make that is measurable is the number of clicks on the website. Like if we have the the public art highlighted, because I did look at what Dorothy was saying, but it's sort of tucked away. It's not in any of the main searches. So if we have public, you know, something fancy that catches people's attention and it's there, and then we could just measure how many people are clicking to that, clicking that. that Yes. Uh, yeah, I've been silent mainly because I've agreed with pretty much everything that people have said, and I did want to thank the ad hoc committee. I think it's a really good uh, draft bylaw, and I think it, it answered all my concerns about the original one. So thank you. Okay. So anything else on this subject? Um, no, but I, I really want to thank Bill because he did a lot of the heavy lifting on this and he was fun to work with. And then I, I, I live up in North Amherst near the Mill River Recreation Area and I was walking out to the trail system and there's in, this incredible sculpture that's a salamander or something curled up over in the corner that winds around with circles. I said, do you know about this? And he said, oh yeah, we put it in. And I got that was one of the, you know, I thought we don't often know what's been done out there. And it was a discover, sort of a discovery and way off, but people would come over, over to the corner, you know, so what it did to that park was something, and Sharon, in terms of maintenance, I think it can be there forever because it's a rock. You know, I mean, the way they did it was thoughtful in that who's going to go over there and keep sprucing it up. <laughs> but, but that will be a long term. Since we don't spruce up our buildings, we're going to have to worry about um, whatever we put in. Yeah, there's a similar sculpture actually near the baseball fields over at the Mill River uh, Recreation Area. The, the, in, in, is, and then the salamander is the one that's at Cushman Common. This is Mil the one I was Mill River. I saw Cushman too, but Mill River's got the. You it's know, not the, a salamander though. It's, oh, it's not. It, it's, it's a new spotted salamander, but I don't think Public Art Commission put those in. I have to check into the history. Okay. Of that. Well, I don't know who put it in, but I <laughs> yeah. love it. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, the salamander. I, I think about it all the time because I live across the street right. from Cushman Common. Uh, the. Uh, so let's go on and talk about the committee charge because I wanted to get that done before Sonia has to go. We don't vote on the percent for art yet? I think what we were going to do is um, do the quantification, um, have um, uh, probably Kathy maybe take the lead on doing a report from the committee that captures what we talked about if she's willing. And um, I have my notes that I can share with her. And uh, anybody else who has something that they want to share with her certainly could do so if she's willing to do that. And uh, then we would come back with the, with the information on the uh, quantification and Sonia may need to help with the bonds that are not uh, debt exclusion if we're going to use the program for the debt exclusion part. Uh, then uh, we'll have a report and I think we'll vote on the report. We won't vote today. Okay. Anything else on that? And Kathy, is that okay? Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. So, Bill, thank you. Um, we're going to go on to other things. You're welcome to stay, but you know that we're now passing to the next time. Yes. Just another small point. It might be worth making, keep creating a database of local. I've seen some other towns do that, where they maintain a database of local artists. Do you, uh... 
that's something we're working on with the cultural district and Jeff Kravitz. So it's very much in conversation. It's a little tricky and it costs money. So, <laughs> but if you guys want to help us find some money for that, that'd be great. <laughs> Thank you. Um, the committee charge question, I wanted to get to before Sonia had to go and I'm, so I'm conscious of time for that reason. Um, the committee charge itself is fairly straightforward. A lot of it is actually based upon the charter and quotes charter sections um, where the committee and the charter intersect. Um, but we are asked to comment and see if there's any changes that we want to propose to the charge. So I wanted to um, ask that question. But the other thing that needed to be noted is that the um, GOL committee, in addition to asking us and all committees to review their charges, also is uh, raised the question of having the audit committee's functions merged into the finance committee. And um, I think that that's a, actually a much more uh, tricky issue. And uh, I think Dorothy's our member on that committee. Yes. And uh, uh, the uh, question is whether it makes sense to do that and whether we have the capacity to take on the amount of work. Uh, there are two aspects of the audit committee, and Dorothy can tell us a little bit about how much time she's observed in spending, but one is to meet with the auditor um, at the end of the process, and the other is the audit, auditor selection assignment, which is uh, provided for in the charter. Well, the last part we haven't done yet. So at, at present, the meetings have not been arduous. There were very few of them. Um, things were explained to us. We looked at them. We thought about them. Um, Pat's the chair of that committee. It hasn't had a meeting in a while because uh, we're waiting for, um, <clears throat> I guess, the present auditor to complete the work. And then um, we also have to try to choose another one. Um, isn't, Aline, aren't you on that committee? Or you've been to all the meetings? I've, I've come to your meetings, but I'm not on the committee. So from my position of inexperience, because we haven't finished the process, I don't see why the Finance Committee couldn't do it. Um, I, I guess my first question is, is, there any, is it just a question of workload, or is there any perceived conflict of interest in having the Finance Committee also do the audit? Uh. I'm going to ask you actually, Lynn, from her experience with other agencies to talk about the second, and then I'll come back to the first, uh, the, the time question, because I have the experience of having served on the prior audit committee in our former form of government for a number of years. And Lynn? Um, I've served on finance committee for the Armour Survival Center, which in their case, they also do the audit. And separately, I serve as the chair of the audit committee for the Girl Scouts of Central and Western Mass. And in that case, their bylaws require that there be a separate audit committee and that that audit committee not be members, that the chair of that audit committee not be a member of the board. So they see the audit in that case as really um, overseeing, if you will, providing oversight. In a, in a way that um, we think of all audits doing that, but they separate it, make it even one step removed. Um, I've talked to both auditors uh, in of those two different organizations about this, and on neither occasion have any of them said it definitely has to be this way or the other. They've said it's a preference and it's not a requirement. So. Um, as far as the amount of time it takes, generally we would just meet once a year for, and this went on for a number of years uh, that I was on it and uh, we would get the audit in advance so that we'd have a chance to look at it and then the auditor would review it with us and um, sort of give an overview and respond to questions. Um, there was a um, in the, under the prior arrangement, it was sort of split into a number of categories. So there was a member of the Finance Committee, a member of the Select Board, um, 
a member of the school committee, a member of the library trustees, and uh, a member of the public. Uh, and uh, um, the, uh, I mean, that it, it really was the preparation for the one meeting and the one meeting per year. Uh, the selection of the auditor was not uh, delegated to that committee, which is different from the current <coughs> process because uh, that's uh, provided for in the charter that it's council responsibility, so it has to be a council committee to assist. Uh, Sonia, I had asked to uh, just let us know um, whether we're missing something by not having a member of the school committee and a member of the library trustees currently serving on the audit committee and um, <coughs> so. I really don't think it'll be a problem because um, school committee members can come to the finance committee member and, and give their comments on the audit if they have any. Generally, for all the years I've done it, there's really not been a whole lot of questioning. Our management letters have always been clean. That's usually where you get most of the dialogue at audit committees when there's uh, management letter comments and um, better ways that we could do things or something like that. But as far as the financials themselves, those are pretty straightforward and there really hasn't been a whole lot of questions about that. So I don't think personally that it would affect too much to not have um, library members or I'm not saying that, I'm not trying to say that we don't need them or anything, but I'm just, I don't think it should affect this at all. I believe the charter is silent on that issue as to whether the audit committee should include people from the library and the schools, but I can check that. Yes, Kathy. Um, I think it makes sense to bring it into finance. And then my question was, I mean, we're uh, a relatively large committee counting our uh, resident members. So we could have a subgroup of us, if it requires extra meetings, be working on it. At least I would think we would be able to to, to do that. Um, and so that w I'm going to phrase that as a question. Could we do that? So would it be when we're specifically focused on audit, could we say here's a subcommittee of our committee that's going to meet? Or would it be a, full c a call for the full committee? Um, or could we make that decision down the road? Sorry. Generally, um, in the past, the audit committee was just there to review the audit, the auditors, it's just basically the auditors presenting it to the, fine, to the um, audit committee. And then um, everyone would go back to their respective boards and give their report. So it's not, there's not a lot of work to it. I, am, I see it only being one meeting a year, maybe two just to sign the engagement letter since that's no longer the town manager that does that. This year, I know we're supposed to go out and bid for it. I'm dragging my feet on that one for many reasons. But um, other than that, it's, it's really not labor intensive. There's not a lot. Once, once the audit is done, it's done. The, the charter basically says we have to have an independent audit. It says it has to be done by an outsider, obviously. And the town manager shall include in the annual budget the sum to cover that. Um, and the town clerk is supposed to coordinate, the clerk of the town, of the council, is supposed to coordinate the individual or firm selected. Does she know that? No, not that I'm aware of. And uh, <laughs> the audit needs to come to the town council and the town manager no later than March 1st. I don't see this as a big deal. I also, on the two committees I'm on that do audits, we actually do get involved in the selection of a new audit firm. Sonia, in meeting with the audit committee, has talked about the difficulty of this in Western Mass, where there's really only two firms who do municipal audits that are within reasonable commuting distance. And so if we brought in anybody else from Boston, we're gonna start paying big bucks just for the privilege of driving to Western Mass. So, um, so 
You know, I remember when we set up the separate audit committee, when I read the charter language, we didn't have to do that. We just no. decided to, because yeah. we didn't want the whole council to have to right. sit in on this. So it, it sounds like it's easy just to fold it into what finance. I have one question here. Yes. Um, our present audit committee um, has somebody on it who's, in fact, the chair is not a member of the finance committee. Is that a plus or a minus? President audit, audit Committee only has one Finance Committee member on it. Um, I, I mean, we can... So, I mean, is, 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 is there a point to having non-Finance Committee members on the Audit Committee? That's, that's my question. Again, that goes back to the two different examples I gave you. Some nonprofits only have like one finance committee member on it. Other nonprofits don't. Um, I think that the we're having this conversation a little bit in a vacuum because um, GOL is looking at the various committees and with some general guide, guidance or guidelines, they're trying to come up with ways to reduce the burden of work on counselors and therefore also trying to reduce the number of committees. Um, when they get done with that, um, there therefore needs to be a survey done. Well, it doesn't need to be a survey, but that's the practice that I personally established. A survey done of counselors to say, which committees would you like to be on? So there could even be changes of membership on finance committee or any other committee. Yeah, I don't, yeah, Sonia. I will say um, past audit committees have always been really hard to pull together every year because they only met once a year and it was hard to get somebody from each of the other um, committees and an at-large member in there. So a lot of times there's no quorum. There was never a quorum uh, requirement or anything. I would think it would be a much easier process just to schedule it into a finance committee meeting myself. Just. I mean, there, there is some benefit to it. Um, the audit is different from looking at a budget. Um, they are very different documents. And, uh, but it, uh, when you're talking about the financial health of the town, it's a, a, an important measure. So that there is some logic to putting it within the finance committee. Um, and uh, the other thing that I was, uh, getting back to from the beginning as uh, Sonny and I were talking about it. Uh, the auditors usually, um, the, our current auditors usually pick one particular part of town government to do a more extensive review. And uh, I recall at least one time that there was school revolving funds was the um, topic of the day so that schools did get reviewed, and as Sonia reminded me, um, the library is there because while their expenditures are paid by the library and audited by the library, other than personnel, the personnel is run through the town. And uh, we, we provide the personnel services so that that aspect of it is subject to the audit. Uh, if, uh, Do we want to just see if there's a, what somebody wants to make a motion to recommend um, um, or not recommend having the audit function assigned to this committee? I'll make I'll make a motion that we fold audit into finance. I think it's a great idea. Okay, so we have motions made and seconded. I don't think further discussion is necessary, but if there is any, and I don't know. If, because we would want um, the entire committee to be a part of it because that gets us in um, the benefit of having somebody who's not on the, some, three people who are not on the council potentially there. Yes. I, I'm, I'm willing to take on that additional role, what you're asking. <laughs> yeah, okay. 
So uh, let's stay to see if we have a vote since we have a motion on the floor. All in favor indicate by raising hands and aye. saying aye. 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 Uh, so it's unanimous 5 0. Uh, so. And uh, is there any other? Uh, why did we do this um, so that we can just keep moving? Take a look, one last look at the charge. And I will also let Mary Lou know this. And if I haven't heard anything else within a couple of days, uh, that there's other aspects um, of the charge that people want to raise um, to either uh, clarify or include, exclude. Um, otherwise, um, I will let GOL know that we've completed our discussion and that we're okay with the charge as is with that one change. Um, so, um, and if there's um, something that somebody spots, um, then I will uh, tell them that we're still going to um, work on it a little bit longer, but let them know the piece about the audit nonetheless. That's yes. fine. I, I don't know um, where. GOL is with regard to other conversations regarding the finance committee meeting, a fi finance committee. At one point I had heard some other um, comment, and frankly, I never fully understood it. Um, but uh, there may be a point in time where once GOL comes back with their proposed changes in the charges that we may want to look back again at the Finance Committee charge. I hadn't heard anything from them uh, as far as things that they wanted to, that they had spotted in advance to change other than the one we talked about. It was vague and it referred to something like restricting us to municipal finance. And I, I'm like going, okay, what does that mean? Um, so, and I haven't heard anything from it since. Um, okay. I mean, I, as I say, I think the charter defines us so clearly that um, it's sort of hard to imagine where you go with that. Uh, anything else that people want to talk about on this? Because the other thing we will, yes. I think um, the present charge of the Finance Committee with the um, three members of the community, um, just in our discussion of the audit, I think that the, the idea of some bringing in another perspective while being familiar with what the Finance Committee is doing, yet bringing in other perspectives, gives that, that sense of objectivity that I think that um, we were looking for. So I think that the uh, charge is very good as it is. Yeah, and I, I think that I hope that uh, the um, GOL is uh, consulting the rest of the audit committee because um, they're in the midst of work, and um, it's also would they like to finish the current audit and would they like to finish the selection process? Yes. Glad you brought that up. I wanted to make everybody aware that the, this audit probably will not be done until the end of January, mid-February. We have to wait for outside agencies to get their reports into us and stuff. We're waiting for numbers from Hampshire County Retirement. That's usually the holdup. Last couple of years, it's been March that the audit's done because of that. So um, I think um, the auditors have everything they need, and now they have to pull it all together. So it'll probably be early February. Okay. And I'll just let you know one other thing and then I'm gonna to go to the housing um, policy so we can get going if you have to go, um, understand. Um, the piece that, um, I guess, uh, oh, I know it was OPEB. Um, the prior finance committee representative on the um, audit committee in the old form of government was for many years was Anurag Sharma. And Anurag um, took ownership in that dual capacity over the OPEB issue. 
and the one place that there actually is some significant um, overlap in our needing to understand OPEV um, is because it appears in the audit, it is quantified in the audit. Um, and there was a real advantage to having his um, being in both roles. So I just pointed that out because we puts all of us into a higher level of understanding about what's an important but not easy. Yes. Um, since you brought up OPEB, I want to make everybody aware that our um, normal uh, actuary that we've been using for the last couple of years, um, Dan Sherman is retiring, so we were need to go out to bid for a new actuary at the same time, just so you know. Yeah, I think we probably need to have a conversation at a later date as to whether the choice of the actuary is an executive function or uh, in which case it's really within the town manager's role to choose the actuary. But I'm not. I think actuary and audit are two different things. Actuary. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I don't think that there's anything in the charter about it, and uh, so it is a consultant to, uh, it, it, it's something we probably need to talk, to have a conversation with Paul about, uh, to just get that clarified before we get, complete the process. Just as another note on the audit, I mean, if, I don't, is the audit, a, targeting any one particular area this year? Um, here trying to remember which two departments we went on. I'm pretty sure it's the second floor. Okay. And I can't remember the second one, but I will get Is it, it library or schools? No. Okay. So, but if, just as an example, it seems- I remember. I'm Senior sorry. Center, since we have a new administrator, okay. she wanted it to be looked at. So it may be that on the day that we actually review the audit, we invite people who represent those areas into the audit meeting or something, however you and Paul would agree uh, to do that, or Paul, of course, would be there. That's fine. Usually if there are findings or suggestions that are in the management letter, they're well aware of it and their, their response is in there, so. Right. That would be exactly. fine. Exactly. Okay. Okay. So anything else on audit? If not, let's talk a few minutes about housing and then I think that we can probably um, conclude the meeting so that we can um, meet our goal of getting out of here by four o'clock so that everybody has a chance to get home. Yes. Okay. Um, I know we, we, we jumped over financial indicators and I don't want to have us stay lo longer than four o'clock, but I missed the four towns meeting on schools and so looked at the material just before I came here and then looked at our uh, target increases. So I'm wondering whether on January 6th we might come back to, um, we, so I'll, I'll tell you what I saw. It's if we said, let's try, have our guideline be two and a half percent and then I open up the school budget and it says wages in, are going up by 2.8 and health insurance is going up by 7%. I'm thinking, huh, um, that looks to me like someone's going, that group is going to have to really tighten their budget. So I don't know whether that became part of the discussion on Saturday on December 7th, 7th and or not. Okay. I'll answer that really quickly. Um, and uh, we can come back to it at the next meeting. The, um, but the answer is no, it did not come up in that context, but a different piece that was related came up because we did talk about um, what it would be for a level services budget and um, applied against um, the various methods. And there was a chart that was put forward in that. The um, agreement last year, there was a two-year agreement, um, which, uh, you know, the question was whether all four towns are still um, going to support the, um, the two-year agreement moves us to 40 percent, 
number in 40 percent actually brings us out of balance by $70,000, seven zero. And um, we recognized that because we had been um, supporting the consensus agreement of last year as a community, um, but we were sort of in a, the odd position that the number that we were um, supporting was actually out of sync a little bit with the two and a half percent. And uh, uh, we also, I, I did make a point very strongly to the four towns that um, the two and a half percent is not a f easy for us to begin with because we're, it, it involves a million dollar projected deficit in the budget, which of course we hope to close as the budget process develops, but we don't know that that's the outcome. So that this, um, that, that amount adds to it. Um, the uh, focus of the discussion, which would drive up costs, is uh, that um, at least one other town, Shrewsbury, was saying that they don't know that, that their town meeting would support anything other than uh, the um, statutory method, and the statutory method is much more consequential effect on Amherst. And uh, so the, the, the tensions within the room were around uh, the assessment methodology, not the budget. Okay, thanks. Uh, the housing, I thought about the housing, and I'll just tell you where I came up with is I felt that it was important to think about how to frame the discussion, and I came up with trying to look at it in a, several different ways, but mostly to try and look at um, what I'd say the positives and the negatives of having a policy are. And uh, I think we all recognize that the importance of the housing goal and um, the, um, is a part of it. And some of the other things that we talked about um, as far as the um, feeling of um, needing to um, have quality housing and dispersed housing, which are issues that I think were raised by Dorothy um, in, prior, in our prior discussion. Um, but when we get to the cost side of it, I had come up with a longer list. One was, um, is a hard goal reasonable when you define the number of units and um, then what we know about the cost and um, the staff time that's involved with making it happen and whether uh, a hard goal is a reasonable approach for the town as opposed to what I call a more aspirational goal that we're trying to reach in a direction but that we don't put numbers on it to the point that the numbers tie us up and um, with, with significant financial consequence. Um, to get information about that, we had talked about uh, the costs that we have uh, known from prior projects of, for how much it costs to develop the average affordable unit um, and uh, what's that base adjusted for inflation. Can we come up with a projected number and what is it going to cost us? I think uh, the, the question that we talked about was um, everybody says, well, CPAC is the, the big uh, source of funding for housing, which is why we had C the chair of that committee here and uh, CPA committee. And uh, the uh, question that was raised by several people on this committee was other demands um, for CPA funds um, and uh, our goal that we also have put forward to try and um, have CPA pick up capital costs to the extent that it's legally permissible for them to do so in order to relieve pressure 
especially during the time of uh, when we're talking about so many major projects at the same time, and uh, that there was actually, I think we had some language in the guidelines about that too. Um, seizing, uh, I, one of the things that I've always felt is, is that um, we recognize that uh, the success that we've had in prior housing projects is uh, trying to just seize opportunities. And the other thing I asked Chris Brestrup to report back to us at the next meeting, um, and she said she would give it some thought and talk to Nate Malloy, was uh, how much staff time gets involved in these various projects, because I know there was a tremendous amount of staff time that got put into um, North Square and um, out of the planning department in, in to get to where we are, were with the number of affordable units. She pointed out that that's actually true on several other projects that she mentioned, including Aspen Square and uh, uh, 132 Northampton Road. Um, so uh, I wanted her to think about how much staff time was involved in these various proposals and uh, whether that's something we should quantify. Um, but I don't know if there are other things that uh, we've thought about. I was trying to not uh, delve into too many of the housing issues uh, that are not financial as I was doing the outline, but we had some good list. We had a really good discussion about it. And uh, the, one of the most significant one was um, about um, other populations that can't afford housing and uh, working uh, people who are starter families and people who are starting out their careers um, were the examples and the other um, group is homeless. And yes. Well, the zoning subcommittee, the, they have been seeming to be concentrating more on um, two things. One is the inclusionary zoning bylaw, which they would hope to get added <clears throat> so that it's not the town doing, paying for the um, affordable housing, but that it would be developers doing a 10% say. Um, and the other one was uh, the missing middle, which is the people you were referring to. Um, and thinking of the um, uh, possible ways that you could make that easier. And I guess they were, um, I think Maria was gonna, is gonna give a report on supplemental dwellings and on making it easier for uh, owner-occupied houses to have auxiliary apartments. Um, so, that's kind of like not coming in and taking our CPA dollars. I, I think you're making a very good point. If some of that money can in fact go to help on the capital projects, I think that should be something that we should be considering. So I was missing middle in the second thing you were. The, the, the inclusionary zoning bylaw, yeah, which would that. say, for example, as in um, um, the new housing on University right. Drive, um, where it's just kind of done and it's part of the, I don't, I don't know what the trade-off is and what the, uh, those rules have to be made clearer. They're not, they're not there yet. But um, that it would be the developers would just automatically include some affordable housing so that we don't build up this big um, lack. Lynn? I, I just want to go back to the CPA issue and because I, I realize that any group would love to have some place where they get a guarantee of a certain percentage of money. I don't care whether it's for housing or for art or for whatever. I mean, it's like, you know, it's a dream. And my biggest concern is, because I've actually heard that we may be in line for some significant increase in CPA dollars, and if we are in line for some significant increase in CPA dollars, and we would end up doing a percentage, to me, that encourages perhaps not choosing best projects, 
are wise projects. It just in, encourages spending for the sake of housing. So I, I really want to reemphasize that issue that I do not approve or personally support the idea that any group gets some automatic percentage of any kind of fund. Okay. Um, I'll, I'll build on that a little bit, and it might, I guess one of my overarching questions is, I mean, I don't mind the idea of trying to think through housing policies, sort of a guiding policy with some principles in it, um, and my original set of questions were, I didn't know enough to figure out how to figure out the pieces, including the pieces of to what extent as new buildings are being built in town, is it incorporated in developers and more dense development um, of someone doing a unit. But I found uh, these tables that have been given to us quite revealing in terms of more bang for the buck in terms of units. It looks like some of the owner-occupied habitat houses um, in the amount of CPA money we put in was significantly less than some of the others, um, you know, or renovations. So I think in thinking very strategically and analytically, so it's not that you've got a money but just spend it, but spend it really wisely um, and justify why we're spending it here and not there. And I'm not sure, um, I'm new, as people know, I'm new to town government and I'm certainly new to watching CPA, but I'm not sure there's been that outside work that would give them a framework to be able to be um, cr constructively critical about what comes to them, you know, because it's, they have to, they're, they're sort of a push to spend out the amount of money they have based on the proposals. So weed out the weakest of the proposals and look what you've got, rather than try to get, my hope would be the town would try to get way too many proposals coming in. So then you winnow it down to the best of them rather than say, well, we got 15 and we can fund 13. You know, it's, I'd like to have a, a bigger set of buckets so you could say if there are these four, um, put them up against some screen. And, and this information I know is just coming in to us in pieces, but it's, it's pretty revealing as you look toward this per unit, and I know, you know we're, we're apples and oranges because sometimes it's a repair of a place and sometimes it's building something new. Um, so, so I don't know where we go with this, Andy, but I thought some of the questions we asked have prompted the beginning of a flow of information that since my background is go think like a wonk and work, work some numbers out, you know, like what would I think might be a policy in terms of a framework without saying, is it 200 units, is it 100 units, but how do we spend our money wisely where some opportunities are of our own making, some we have to wait for a developer want to build something in town before we can say 10% of those or 5% belong to affordable. So that's just, um, that's a, just a general statement, and I like some of the habitat things because they're not so pegged to, unless you're under 100% of poverty, you could be a working family with a slightly higher income and you're putting sweat equity into your home and so you really care about it. It's a different way of thinking. It's a more permanent, we're bringing people into town that want to be here and are working hard. So I think this, uh, the impetus to start this inquiry has produced some really useful information. So I, I don't know whether we say within six months we'd like to think this through, what CRC doing? Where do we go with this would be the question. Well, CRC already has submitted their report. And Theirs was more in reaction to the particular proposal. And I'm thinking, suppose we, the council wanted to think this through, you know, like we have had one before us. Where might we want to how might we want to shape something without a timeline? Like, it could be 12 months from now. We, we are, have been kind of thinking through these different kind of levers. Where do we think the problems are the most? How would we target what if we could when the opportunities arise? So that's, 
the way I think about this as we start to get the pieces of information. Yes, it's Shalini. Um, building on what you said, I think I would like to see us use this information in terms of, you know, what is the cost, of course, but it was interesting to see that some of the cost was more like cash going out of CPA and the other is cost like of lost revenue or taxes. So how do, we, you know, they're not the same. Like the North Square, we, it's 2.8 million over 10 years, but we're also getting from them yearly taxes on the remaining stuff. So it's, you know, so like finding, like creating criteria and then is it multifamily? Is it, you know, like habitat where there's more community aspect? Is it, uh, disp you know, in integrated, not like we have all just affordable housing in one place, but it's integrated mixed uh, income buildings. So we create maybe guidelines or criteria and then guidelines for what our, uh, our uh, priorities might be based on all, using all of this information. I think that would be a great idea for the town council or for the finance or whoever, someone to figure out. Uh, Dorothy? Yes, the list of, a pres of all well, the affordable housing that we have already, I was going over that again um, this morning. And I have a thousand questions. I don't understand the, the numbers. But you, the cost per unit varies ex hugely. So I really would like to have either a housing person from the town or a builder or some people who know what those numbers mean and why somebody, this unit costs uh, 11,000 and that unit costs 109,000. Um, because I think that's really kind of the information that we need. It's, because uh, I was adding up the number of units and I was trying to figure out which ones, are, are there any uh, owner occupied? There were a couple and there were some that wasn't clear which they were and rental and so right now I just feel we're, we're working in the dark. Um, so I, I think we need better information. Some of it, uh, I probably could sit down and tell you a little bit about from my own knowledge of it, but I'm not going to do that now because I wanna, I'm looking at the clock. Um, the uh, habitat ones, for example, uh, a lot of times there, it's a uh, combined effort that um, has a nonprofit in addition to Habitat that's worked together to come up with the land and the, the Habitat construction proposal. And then it all comes together with um, some financial assistance from CPA so that there's a, a, a concerted effort that's what I referred to as seizing opportunities because uh, they would come to us. Uh, it, uh, really all of the ones that we've been successful on, it's us, others coming to us. We didn't go out to, to uh, Cinda Jones to say, hey, why don't you find a nonprofit housing developer and build your property. Uh, she came up with the idea of building her property and looking for a nonprofit uh, uh, developer and uh, for the housing piece with Beacon. And uh, so it's in each one of them, when you go back to it, uh, it was not something that arose from the town or from a town, the town housing committee. It arose from somebody who saw an opportunity and went after it. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, which is why I, I think that we, um, Creating a goal puts pressure on us to do something that we've never done before. Uh, why don't I try and see if I can do a, do a little bit of a draft on this, and I'm gonna see if I can do a couple things. One is to see if we can get Nate Malloy to come into our um, next meeting, and Nate is the one who put together those charts. So he's the logical person to see if he's comfortable um, present, uh, answering the question that you're raising, Dorothy. Um, and he can tell us about some of the projects in more detailed um, information about the projects that have been developed. And uh, then uh, in, in 
I think that uh, that in combination with whatever Chris Prestrup might tell us about mm -hmm. the amount of staff time that's been involved in prior projects and that she might project for future projects and the capacity of her department to take on that this work that's being described in here uh, is, uh, I think, would be helpful. Uh, are there other pieces that we should be going out for immediate investigation on? And otherwise, okay. I think I'd start the draft and get everybody in for the next meeting. So just one, one comment. After, as a result of this discussion with Nate and, and Chris, maybe we could make a list of things that seemed more, as you'd say, more bang for your buck, more efficient ways of providing lower income housing or moderate income housing as opposed to the ones that are more expensive. I mean, there may be some really wonderful things about some of the more expensive. So we'd have some idea of, of why you would make this choice of this approach over that approach. I think it's a good point. I think it's been actually that uh, was raised in some of our prior discussion and I think it's a logical follow up. So, I mean, said all of that, is there anything else that somebody wants to say on this topic right now? Because if not, um, just real quickly on what, what it also is on the agenda, major capital investments process, next steps. Uh, the, did you have anything you want to take up on that today? Very quickly, the comment period online remains open through December 20th and then the consultants will incorporate that along with the feedback we got at the actual listening sessions and so it's possible that by the time we meet on the 7th of January we will have that feedback okay um, and the uh, I think that, that since there's no public to make public comment, there's nothing else that we have on the agenda. So um, I think I can just, uh, by agreement, declare adjournment at five minutes after four. And thank Amherst Media for uh, being with us today. And, uh, uh, and happy holidays, everybody. everybody. Happy holidays, and thank you all for being here on a tough day. Thank you.